So we're live. Okay, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Daniel Brantes Ferreira. I'm the CBMA's CEO and, and chief, uh, chief editor of the International Journal of Law and Changing World, which is a co-host co of this event today. And I'm really glad to have all the editor, mo most of the editors of the journal here uh, joining here to, to present such interesting topics. And so I'm just gonna introduce you you guys. Uh, first, uh, Professor Elisaveta Gromova. She is, uh, she, of course, she holds a PhD. She's, a, she's an associate professor, professor at the Department at, of Constitutional Law and Administrative Law uh, and Deputy Director for International Cooperation at South Euro State University, which is a national research university in Russia, in the South Euro, in Chelabinsk, the city of Chelabinsk. And we have also here joining us today, Maria Bajina, which is Masha in Russian that I just learned. And uh, she's associate professor at the Department of Business Law at Euro State Law University in Russia. And her field of expertise includes transportation and business law. Her topic today will be regulation of transportation, a glance in the future. I didn't say your topic, it is Professor Elisaveta, which will be future of the regulation sandboxes approach, uh, which is really interesting for the Brazilian public because we had our regulation on sandboxes last year. So it's it's a, a really cutting edge topic. And last but not least, we have our dear friend from India, which is a, a really a expert researcher. And he's going to speak about artificial intelligence and human rights, designing a roadmap for future. Dr. Nitish Kumar. I'm not going to pronounce your last name, Nitish. I, I can't do it. Sorry. Uh, Associate Professor of Law at Gogotia's University and Research Advisor at South Euro State University, Guest Faculty at American Romanian University. And his fields of expertise are international humanitarian law, law and human rights. So you, yeah, you, you also have law and technology as an expert, uh, as, a, as a field of expertise, Nitish. You're being humble here in your resume, but okay. So uh, this, I'm just going to share my screen here. And thanks for joining us today. This is a really great event for, for us here. And with all these three great professors and, of course, three good friends. So. Let me just, you know, duplicate here. So this event is hosted by the Brazilian Center of Arbitration and Mediation, the CBMA, which is located here in Rio de Janeiro, and also this newborn journal, uh, which was created by, by Professor Elisaveta Gromova and myself and all of you, the editors, and just recently, like one month ago, the International Journal of Law and Changing World. And so if you want to take a look at the journal, just go on the website. The, the, the URL is right here in your screen. Just, just enter there and have all the information you need. But as we are like uh, making a big premiere here today, I'm going to say some things about the journal. So this is our editorial team. The, the purpose of the journal is to be an international, international hub. So we have many countries and five continents represented here in the journal. We have uh, Brazilians and Russians and, and people, mostly Brazilians and Russians in the, 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 editorial, the editorial board. And I, I'm, I'm one of the editors in chief, but I make fun saying that Elisaveta Gromova is actually the editor in boss. So she's actually the boss here of this journal. She rules this journal. And whatever I need to do there, I ask for Elisaveta, Professor Gromova authorizations before doing anything. So we have myself and Professor Elisaveta there. And as assistant editors, we have Professor Bianca Farias, Cristiane Giovannini, Maria Masha Bajna, which is here today, and Professor Nitish uh, Updai, which is here also with us. We have as assistants, editorial assistants, some students, Bernardo from Cândido Mendes, Boris, Yulia, and also uh, we have uh, Chris, 
Cristiana and from Cândido Mendes also, and Elia. I, I think Elia is Masha's student. He, he accepted our invitation. So uh, we have students that, that are going to help us with social media and other, and other you know, chores in the journal. Just, just so you have a picture, as I said before, we are really in a real international journal. And, and the purpose of the journal is to join the, the, the law academic community around the world. So we have 28 members currently in our editorial board, 13 different countries, five different continents. We, don't, we just don't have Australia, or like Oceania and uh, Antarctica represented. So if you know anyone there, just tell me. And, and we are pro-gender parity. So just people, so, so people can know we have 14 men and 14 women uh, exactly represented in the editorial board. And we're gonna make an effort to keep in that way, to keep 50-50 uh, rate between men and women. So what is the journal about? We are a true independent journal. We don't want any institution uh, controlling the journal. This journal is for the professors and for the academia and for the students, not for our institutions. And, and our goal is of course, after two years to get Scopus and, and web of science so we're following all the rules to get there since the beginning of the journal and there's no fee to publish in the journal it's an open access journal completely public anyone can access if you publish a paper there it's going to be open for any for everyone it's a double blind peer review journal of course we have almost 25 26 reviewers already there uh, registered in our journal and we're going to have two to four issues per year. At first, we're going to have two, but we're thinking about uh, inviting guests, uh, editors to make like special issues, like a third issue per year or a fourth issue per year. And, and I'm going to ask Professor Elisaveta to speak a little bit about the focus of the journal. Uh, Professor Elisaveta, what kind of papers do we want uh, to publish here in this new journal, the, the International Journal of Law in Changing World. What does changing world means to you? That's the question. Well, when we were discussing uh, the idea of the creation of the journal, uh, we were thinking about something really, really broad uh, because now it, it is really a moment uh, when the world is changing and the law transforming due to the digitalization, due to the uh, ecological situation and due to the pandemic and so on. So the law as a whole is changing. And that is why we decided, well, of course, because I am an expert in law and digital technologies, the first idea <laughs> was to create a journal in the sphere of law and digital technologies. But of course, the um, aim of each researcher is to develop himself or herself. And of course, it is not good to stop on the one area we all should develop. And that is why, of course, we decided to choose this very, very broad topic. So everyone uh, who wants to publish his brilliant or her brilliant research in our journal on, on the broad topics of transforming law, you are all welcome here. And how, how many words are, are, do we need to, does the paper has to need? Uh, between five and 5,000, 7,000, I think, I think it's something like that, right? 6,000 to 8,000 words, Six. average. Average in Scopus. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks, Professor. So we have our call for papers for the first issue open here until January the 15th. And of course, we also have the call for reviewers. If you want to be a reviewer at, at, our, at our journal, you need to hold a PhD or a master's degree and you re need to register in the journal's website. So if you have any queries, any questions, just address them to myself or to Professor Elisaveta and we'll be happy to answer them. And, you know, I'm really glad that we are starting this new project and I, I truly hope that we will be successful and many, there are many years to come of this journal and, and that, the, that we can contribute to the academia and to the law field. That's our main goal here. We're not 
uh, earning and, and uh, money by with this journal we're just we just want to contribute with our community our academic community our international academic community that's the, that's our main goal here so uh please uh, professor elisaveta if you want to share a screen and start your your lecture i'm gonna be here to learn and thanks everyone for joining us today and thanks professor nitis and professor masha once again of course i won't so let me start sharing i hope you can see yeah it's there mm -hmm. so uh as far yes as i already told i'm an expert in the sphere of law and digital technologies and the regulatory sandboxes uh is one of them one of my main research area this it is a very very uh cutting edge topic and of course i'm very glad for the opportunity to uh share the results of my research today so i chose the topic the future of regulations and boxes approach i love these pictures <laughs> and uh i really love uh, what elon musk said about the creation of the artificial intelligence and it is actually not just about the artificial intelligence it is about all digital technologies so we all know that uh, now we are in the process of the global scale digitalization and a lot of many digital technologies are emerging day by day and they captured almost all spheres of our lives so i cannot live without my phone <laughs> um, so and of course it is the potential of all these technologies is really, really promising on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, is emergence of these technologies connected with different threats. And that is why uh, the quotation of uh, the Elon Musk, who said that with the creation of the artificial intelligence and other digital technologies, I will add on behalf of Elizaveta Gromova, uh, it looks like we are summoning the demon. So we really want to create something. Yes, it, 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 it looks like it will be potentially very, very good. But on the other hand, yes, there always is something on the other hand. And on the other hand, there are a lot of threats and risks connected with the creation of the digital technologies. And of course, this process the process of emergence on the spreading of the digital technologies represent a biggest challenge first of all for law why because it, it depends on law mainly how will we regulate and what will be the future of the regulation of the digital technologies uh how will country uh behave uh itself what the policy of the country will be in regarding with the creation of the digital technologies if the policy and regulation will be appropriate appropriate of course the country can be can become in the future yes of course in the future the country will become a leader in law in digital technologies so as i said it is a big challenge for law why law always has to react which is a big problem because sometimes we do not know how to react. We say it is the biggest issue nowadays about the artificial intelligence. Uh, Professor Apathai will tell us about it later, I think, because he is an expert in the, in the regulation of the artificial intelligence. So he will say us about this, but just we do not know who or what is artificial intelligence. So and law doesn't know how to react. And law must catch up with the rapidly evolving re relation, which is also very very challenging and of course as a result what do we expect from law we want proper and efficient regulation and that is why of course the regulators the governments across the world they started to search for some ways 
of how should we regulate digital technologies. Uh, and here you can see different, uh, different approaches. The first one, the first approach was doing nothing or wait and see. What does it mean? The government just decided, let's not interfere. Let's just wait and see how will this digital technology evolve and what will be further. Good approach. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, of course not, because we need regulation. The problem is we do not know what can this regulation be. Another approach connected with cautious permissiveness through flexibility and forbearance. What does it mean? Well, for example, uh, there we, we have uh, more than 6,000 uh, special economic zone in the world. And if you want to create digital technologies within the special economic zone, we must give uh, the favorable conditions to the residents who would like to create these technologies. So we are granting some relaxations like tax incentives, custom incentives, and so on. Is that good? On the one hand, of course, yes. But are we sure that these uh, um, entrepreneurs are creating the di com competitive digital technologies which we really need, which are really necessary? No. Are we trying to create a proper regulation? No. Another approach, of course, it is to establish a new regulation. Yes, it is good, of course. But again, the problem is that law should uh, catch up, yes, with the uh, transforming relations, but the law cannot. So we want new regulation, but we still do not know what this regulation, how this regulation should be designed. And the last but not least, uh, no surprises here, that it is a Chinese approach. They chose this approach, it's called test and learn. So a regulator in close cooperation with the innovator craft a framework to test new idea in life environment uh, and adopt safeguards to minimize the impact of potential failure and, does, and set some criteria against which they measure success. So that is how uh, proper regulation could be designed. And as a result of this approach, uh, the new and as we call it here, unorthodox approach or uh, it is called regulatory sandboxes, yes, they, they were created. Uh, to explain a little bit more about what the regulatory sandbox is, I will just make this example. So we all know how extremely important is artificial intelligence nowadays. Sorry, Nitesh, <laughs> again. Um, and we, we, we are highly interested in developing of this technology. And its potential is really, really promising. And if, for example, if we want to use it, we can use this technology in healthcare sector. This, we can have so much favors from using this technology in this sector. For example, here you can see the care mentor artificial intelligence for diagnostics or Botkin artificial intelligence, which can help to detect cancer at its early stages, which is of course extremely important for all the humanity. Yes, but it is uh, this system like Botkin AI or Care Mentor artificial intelligence, this is a medical service, a medical device. And for example, if you want to use officially, if you want officially to use this device in Russia, we need, of course, to register, yes, to pay some money. And the process of registration is very, very long. And there are a lot of requirements. So on the one, on the one hand, we need to develop this technology because it really can help to save people's lives. On the other hand, we have these requirements, which may be excessive, but they are aimed at protecting human rights. So what can we do? And that is why we need regulatory sandboxes. Within this regime, uh, we can just refuse, temporarily refuse from some requirements and just to watch if it will be okay or not. So the regulatory sandbox is a solution that allows to apply regulatory reliefs under current legislation to permit important experimenting for the new digital products. 
And of course, it is allowed to test new digital technology by applying regulatory relaxations in limited period in real market conditions with a real customer. Um, you can see the map, and this map shows how regulatory sandboxes are spread across the world. Of course, uh, the fir the, at first, uh, the regulatory sandbox, as we understand it now, appeared in Great Britain in 2014. And after its successful um, application, this mechanism was spread. And as Daniel said, uh, they, they have new regulatory sandbox since 2020. And in 2021, in Italy, regulatory sandbox appeared. So this uh, mechanism, this tool is really, really promising and the governments can see it. And that is why they are starting to use it. Yes, of course. So I already told you why it is good to use sandbox. Of course, uh, it allows us to test digital technologies in safe environment under the control of regulators. Yes, so in this case, of course, regulatory sandboxes are friends. On the other hand, of course, as, as every new tool, it is not free from shortcomings. And these shortcomings, uh, if we will uh, research these shortcomings, we can see that we can say that regulatory sandboxes is, is not very friendly. They can be a force. Why? So if you are using some relaxations and we are refusing from applying of some regulatory requirements, it could lead to the violation of the human rights. And also there is an opinion, for example, not all countries, most countries would love to um, apply this tool, but not all countries in the world. And the countries like South Africa, they are um, not that enthusiastic about the establishment of this tool. And they're saying that the concept of the regulatory sandbox has become a covered effort to bypass consumers' rights and consumers' protection law. Of course, this mechanism is, mechanism is not free from shortcomings. And let me uh, demonstrate it more clearly under some um, next cases. So, um, first case is about uh, regulatory, I'm calling this regulatory sandbox versus human rights to live. To, to life and to, to safety and so on. So uh, a lot of, many countries are nowadays starting to test unmanned vehicles. Now it is possible only in the condition of the regulatory sandbox. What does it mean? So we can refuse from some uh, regulatory requirements and we can allow to test these unmanned vehicles. But if we will not apply some regulatory requirements, it can lead to some harm to people's life, to the safety, and so on. That is why, of course, uh, and uh, regretfully nowadays, uh, the legislation on the regulatory sandboxes, in sandboxes, it is not, um, the, the legislator are not very much concerned about it. Uh, another case is uh, regulatory sandbox versus personal data protection. Yeah. Of course, it is a well-known fact how important are personal data nowadays. And due to the digitalization, how <clears throat> important is to develop, is to protect personal data. The privacy is the biggest concern nowadays. And of course, uh, the regulatory sandbox uh, has some shortcomings, which can be a threat to the personal data protection. Um, and I want to demonstrate it on the, on the example of Russian regulatory sandbox. Uh, it is the sandbox which aimed at testing artificial intelligence-based technologies in the sphere of healthcare. I already explained how is it important to develop artificial intelligence specifically in the healthcare. Uh, at the same time, of course, we have these regulatory requirements, which must be, which we must, uh, we must not forget about this requirement. 
So what is the problem in uh, Russian regulatory sandbox in, in the sphere of testing artificial intelligence? It is said that all personal data, all the residents of Moscow city, because this regulatory sandbox is established in Moscow city. So all the personal data, all the residents of the Moscow city will be depersonalized and will be used to teach the artificial intelligence how to make this uh, cancer diagnostics, for example. On the one hand, it is good, great, uh, big potential and so on. On the other hand, Russian legislation is not ready for this. We do have the definition of depersonalized data, but we do not know, do not know how to depersonalize. We do not know the procedure of depersonalization. In United States, there is a standard of depersonalization. In Russia, we do not have such. And that is why, see, this is a regulatory sandbox, which we, are, we want to develop. We want to develop artificial intelligence and test it within the regulatory sandbox. On the other hand, we need to secure personal data. And now the residents of the Moscow, the citizens of the Moscow city, they said, no, we do not want our data to be used for a regulatory sandbox. We do not want uh, the, this data will be under experimentation. And that is why uh, now it is proposed to set up the moratorium for these artificial intelligence regulatory sandboxes because the Russian legislation now is not ready. And uh, last case I want to show you, it is the again, the regulatory sandbox versus customers' rights. As I told you, uh, the regulatory sandbox allows us to test digital technologies in real life environments, in real market conditions. What does it mean? So we have a group of customers who will use, who will test these digital technologies or who will test uh, the service or business model based on the digital technologies. And if we are talking about how uh, the customer's rights are protected, well, not very good actually. In, and of course, in not, in, in not all the countries. I will now start, of course, to criticize Russian legislation because I, I do research a lot in this sphere, of, uh, in this sphere, but it is actually about other countries too. So basically, if you are establishing the regulatory sandbox, we just need, regarding to the legislation of Russia and some other countries, we just need a consent, a prior consent of the customers. So are you ready to be an experiment participant or not? But of course, it is not enough because we are refusing from some regulatory requirements. It can be a threat to our rights. And in this case, of course, some countries are really progressive and they do think about customers. And that is why uh, in such countries like Australia, for example, there is a liability insurance. In Russia, we do not have such, which is a really, really sad. We just have this prior consent. We just need to notify the customer that we are working in, they are now under the experimentation and basically uh, that is all and of course uh, you can see here in the slide some proposals so of course we need to have to establish some additional measures as compensations and ins insurance of course it is not just about russia it is also for other countries and of course the representatives of this uh, all the consumer society they also must uh, participate in the decision-making in the sphere of establishing of such regulatory sandboxes. For nowadays, they are not doing this in Russia as well as in other countries. At the same time, it is important. So how to improve current models? Yes, we are talking about the future regulation. Of course, sandboxes is the future regulation, but to use it, to make it, um, to use it properly, of course, we must improve the model. And what, is, what should we need? What, sh what should we do to improve this model? 
We need to establish the rules which will be well integrated with the provision of national and international legislation. We need, of course, to establish a set of measures for protection of potential customers and counterparties, which we do not have now. And of course, we need to give the opportunity for representatives of business community and society to participate in decision making in, uh, connected with the establishing of regulatory sandboxes. So uh, that is all. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for listening. I am ready to answer questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Professor Elisaveta, for your always brilliant lecture and so much content for you know for so, so for says only like 20 minutes so it's you know uh, i recommend people to read your papers on sandboxes they're really interesting and you know they they, they really clarify the topic so uh, if anyone wants to 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 read the, her papers just email us and we will gladly send them to you thanks professor now professor maria bagina with her lecture on regulation of transportation, a glance in the future. Thanks again, Professor Maria, for being here, for join, joining us today. And the floor is all yours. Just if you need to share your screen, just go ahead. Yeah, you got it. <clears throat> Thank you, Daniel, very much. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, I um, before I start uh, my presentation, today's presentation, I have um, uh, two uh, things on my mind and uh, I can't stop but uh, mentioning them and I hope that I would be uh, in time limit. Uh, so I would not abuse uh, my right to uh, present for a long time. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the first thing is uh, that <clears throat> you see, um, I think um, I want to share uh, my emotions with you. I'm glad that um, um, our organizers of this event uh, are so have uh, so great interest, I should say, desire of um, contributing uh, to the problem of uh, law adaptation uh, in the changing world. And it is very important because uh, nowadays, um, even uh, we um, are here in advance of the, the most interesting, the most wonderful, the most uh, exciting uh, holiday, um, I mean, New Year and Christmas, uh, they found the time to organize this event and uh, to uh, gather the speakers who are ready to share their ideas, to discuss uh, the problems uh, that uh, do not have vacations. Uh, they are really uh, here and uh, every day uh, we understand uh, that uh, the problems that our world, that each country and the world itself uh, uh, face um, that they are very sharp and they have to be um, resolved in any way. Uh, hopefully they would resolve in the best way, but still, so we have to speak. And uh, this, uh, about them and to discuss them, because only uh, in this manner we can uh, make progress in um, this field. And uh, the second uh, point uh, is uh, that I'm very thankful for organizers uh, that they invite me and gave me an opportunity uh, to speak about uh, to speak about one of the most important um, uh, problems uh, that exist in a modern economy, in the modern society, uh, the problems of transportation regulation. And uh, I think that it's not the secret that, uh, and the majority will agree that transportation is the base of economy. It is the key branch uh, and any changes, even slight 
changes uh, are reflected in the um, in other spheres of economy, of social life, because transportation is uh, uh, um, is a um, branch that uh, helps us uh, to uh, bring together uh, rather um, different and sometimes very remote parts of the country, uh, this or that country, of the world. I mean, uh, when we have an opportunity to deliver goods from one uh, part of the world to another. Um, uh, transportation is the mean uh, of um, bring people together uh, when mm, they can communicate because they can come uh, by the means of uh, transport uh, and uh, be in another place. And uh, transportation is also um, the mean of uh, um, education yourself because traveling by the means of transport, you can see a lot and enrich your knowledge. And uh, that's why transportation influences uh, every uh, sphere of our life. And we have to uh, speak um, about um, changes uh, that uh, are performing in this field, uh, because, um, as I've said, they would reflect in each, even um, maybe not very uh, vivid sphere of uh, life of society and uh, our country itself. Um, so as uh, far as you could understand, uh, transportation has um, a different, um, we can, uh, we can uh, estimate transportation from macroeconomic or microeconomic senses. But um, I want to say that uh, again, um, any changes that um, do exist in transportation, in the means of transportation, in the ways uh, of uh, documentation of transportation, all of them are reflected in any um, uh, spheres of our life. And uh, that's why um, nowadays we can say that transportation uh, is uh, in disruptive and transformative um, has the value of disruptive and transformative techno uh, technological ch uh, change. It means uh, that uh, even now, as uh, Elizaveta um, Gromova have said that has said that um, there are different um, experiments in the field of transportation, she uh, underlined different uh, fields, but um, uh, we are speaking about transportation. So I um, uh, want to mention this part. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, obvious that nowadays we live in uh, legal uncertainty. Uh, we do not know, we understand that, yes, there are some technological changes, and we understand that somehow they value our life, value uh, different aspects of economy, of uh, social life, but uh, we do not know the opportunities. We do not know the consequences. We do not know the way of using these uh, uh, techno technologies because we are not so much experienced. Uh, yes, of course, the first attempt to create uh, some uh, highly uh, technological uh, uh, objects uh, were made, uh, had been made far, far long ago, but um, but uh, in uh, the scale of these experiments was uh, not uh, so great. And nowadays, uh, these um, technologies are so progressive and uh, they develop in a very high uh, speed. That's why we have to uh, think about uh, um, uh, more moments using uh, that these technologies offer to us. And uh, of course, um, I want to, um, th this 
picture shows that <clears throat> there are so many companies that uh, um, devote their um, activity uh, to uh, transportation, to develop of transportation technologies um, and to introduce them into our uh, daily life. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, the uh, technical progress is ahead of legal progress, is ahead of some change that we uh, can uh, make into regulation. Uh, we cannot uh, do uh, direct experiments with uh, legal regulation because, um, because it is very um, uh, dangerous. We can spoil the situation and the consequences could be uh, very uh, upset. That's why uh, the uh, main idea that the majority of countries, um, the government of these countries do is the creating, um, regulating guidelines. Uh, the majority of uh, countries um, made some um, special programs uh, or some special visions of changing that could be made in a in accordance with the technological changes. And it is very important uh, because uh, you see that uh, changes in transportation um, concerns <clears throat> very different spheres, uh, vehicles, infrastructure, and of course, transportation documentation. Uh, all these spheres that uh, create the whole transportation ecosystem uh, has been changed. And uh, I can bring the example of Russia uh, that uh, now, for now, we have uh, legal acts, um, real legal acts uh, that regulate um, uh, some uh, modern technologies, uh, for example, electronic uh, transportation documentation um, with a new uh, technologies of blockchain. Uh, so blockchain is not only for um, securities, but it is also for uh, exchanging documentation between parties of uh, uh, carriage contracts. Uh, and I try, I try to underline some um, interesting aspects uh, that concerning each part of this uh, transportation ecosystem, uh, as I've said, vehicles, infrastructure, and documentation. So let's come to the um, vehicles. Nowadays, uh, as uh, uh, as it is known, and uh, as uh, Elisaveta has also uh, said, um, there are uh, different approaches to create automated vehicles. And uh, um, it is a very um, uh, interesting um, part of uh, the relations. Uh, it is a very interesting field because uh, here um, we uh, see that automated vehicles could influence um, uh, economic, social, environmental land use. And uh, that's why we have to create a um, complex approach to the uh, regulating uh, automated vehicles implementation. Uh, and uh, nowadays, um, there are Mm, there is legal base for, um, uh, but it's not the full legal base, but there we have something uh, from the legal base uh, of uh, automated vehicles regulation. So we have national legislations. Uh, so as I have spoke about uh, Russian legislation, the, the same, there are some um, programs of uh, using uh, automated vehicles uh, in Germany, in France, and in other countries. So it is not the secret uh, trend uh, that uh, different countries using their um, um, 
vectors of uh, legislation development. And of course, there is uh, some documents concerning um, th that were adopted by United Nations Economic and Social Co uh, Council and some um, documents that was, were adopted by European Parliament. Um, and uh, what the main uh, thing that I want to underline that um, there is no common approach to regulate automated vehicle. There is no common approach to terminology. There is no common approach to regulate the relationships um, which uh, include uh, the use of automated vehicles. There is no common approach of legal consequences of responsibility of people uh, or person uh, who would be uh, responsible for damages uh, that this automated vehicle um, has done. And uh, nowadays, the majority of um, documents that regulate um, uh, the implementation of, um, of the vectors that would be used in uh, creating legislation on implementation of automated vehicles, they based on the classification that was made by a society of, uh, of automotive engineers. Uh, I think that uh, everybody um, have heard uh, has heard about it. And uh, so uh, when we speak about automated vehicles, we speak about uh, level four and level five, highly automated and full automated uh, vehicles. And uh, um, this uh, classification is uh, uh, taken into consideration by each country, by the uh, not only countries uh, as legislators, yeah, uh, when we speak about uh, legislative level, but also by those who perform, uh, who make uh, experiments in the field of um, creating uh, vehicles, automated vehicles. And, uh, but uh, as I've uh, told you, um, uh, uh, the terminology is not uh, single. Uh, for instance, uh, for such uh, categories as level four and level five, uh, we can find such uh, terms as self-driving um, vehicles or autonomous vehicles or um, unmanned vehicles so as we have heard today but there is difference between uh, these uh, terms and we have to pay attention uh, on this problem the problem of using terminology but why uh, it is very important uh, why I speak about the common approach uh, to um, uh, terminology uh, it is important because uh, each country is not isolated in the world each country communicates interacts with each other and uh, when uh, and of course the international trade is uh, can be done only with the use of transportation. Uh, and we have to create such approach that would be um, common for countries that inter, uh, communicate in uh, different spheres with each other. Uh, we have to elaborate such kind of legislation that could uh, help um, other relations uh, not to stop, but to develop and uh, to uh, uh, to um, go ahead. And if we use different terminologies, if we use a different approaches, uh, we could not uh, support a new technology, the implementation of new technology. And this is very important for us as the lawyers. Um, and uh, nowadays, uh, if we speak about, for example, uh, Russian legislation, uh, so uh, in the concept of uh, the development um, of um, road uh, transportation, uh, there are different uh, terms, different notions uh, that um, um, 
that shows the meaning uh, of uh, these, uh, th that has definitions that shows the meaning of this notion. And, but there is no correlation between uh, these um, notions. And this is the problem. The same is in, uh, uh, the same problem is with other concepts of different, uh, of other countries. And uh, um, it is very important to, to speak and to discuss uh, these problems on international level, because it is not the problem uh, of one country. It is the problem of the whole world to create um, the proper uh, and uh, um, efficient uh, legal regulation of uh, implementation of automated vehicles. And uh, there is also changes in transportation as uh, in such component as in infrastructure. So here we speak about, uh, there are some provisions uh, that uh, shows uh, that uh, we need um, we need another attitude to the uh, implementation of infrastructure in transportation. Uh, it is not only the list of objects that we have, such as buildings, such as roads, uh, equipment, or so and so on. But well, nowadays we speak about intelligent transportation system. It means that there is uh, connect, there are connections uh, between the objects uh, themselves with the help of uh, new technology as Internet of Things. And there is also, um, um, uh, it is called infrastructure via infrastructure uh, communication. And there is also um, interaction between transport uh, vehicles and infrastructure uh, because we cannot apply automated vehicle without uh, proper um, intelligent infrastructure because it would be helpless. This automated vehicle, uh, even if it would be very high equipped, uh, if even if it would be um, made uh, in a perfect way, it would be helpless and useless uh, in uh, the present infrastructure, uh, in the current infrastructure. We need to change infrastructure and infrastructure uh, becomes uh, not only the the object, but it also would um, uh, take a place in the communication. And uh, what does it mean, communication? Not the only communication people uh, to people, uh, but communication of objects. That is the idea that nowadays object uh, starts to, um, to uh, deal with each other. And uh, this is very important thing because uh, nowadays legislation uh, does not understand object as the uh, as uh, the person and it would not be I'm sure but we have to call we have to understand as lawyers how to uh, create legislation to um, to um, cover uh, these uh, aspect as the communication of objects. There are some um, keys to this problem uh, that, uh, there, that there would be also people who are standing uh, behind these uh, objects. So uh, nowadays, uh, the majority of countries call them operators. So the operator of um, uh, of intelligent uh, transportation system, the operator of infrastructure and so on. So again, we come to the, again, we see that there uh, along with such um, uh, figures as career, as uh, um, uh, consigner and consignee, we see new figures of transportation process, or we see operators, and we have to understand who will be liable for damages, and do we need uh, more the figure of career, or it would be operator who would undertake all uh, liability uh, for goods, for passengers, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, um, 
And uh, coming uh, to the uh, last part of uh, the elements that uh, create a transportation ecosystem, we speak about transportation documentation. Uh, nowadays, the world is changing in this sphere. It is changing not only in transportation sphere, in, a, in each sphere uh, we face with the um, uh, electronic documentation. But here I do not want to speak about uh, electronic electronic uh, documentation itself. I want to speak about technologies that could be used in this sphere. Uh, and uh, now it is uh, broadly um, discussed uh, such technology as blockchain. Uh, blockchain that will help to make the procedure of changing documentation between uh, transportation companies and uh, the consumers of transportation services um, uh, uh, very visible because we need to um, understand where is the goods, uh, what are the kind of goods. And uh, the, uh, in Russia, this process is very um, uh, supported by uh, the state itself because uh, it is uh, considered that uh, using uh, blockchain um, technology in uh, transportation documentation would have helped uh, to make uh, the process of uh, delivering goods more uh, transparent, uh, more uh, visible for the state. And there would be no such situations when the goods uh, is um, go in any direction that nobody is uh, uh, nobody knows about it. So um, if uh, if uh, it could be, uh, if, but uh, it is very um, difficult to understand how it is managed uh, to be, because uh, we have, uh, um, because each uh, um, performer of the system has its own platform. And uh, now for nowadays, there is no any correlation of these platforms. And for example, imagine that there is international transportation process. And how would these two different platforms that exist in uh, Russia and, for example, in Brazil, correlate with each other? Uh, so uh, we, uh, but uh, uh, but international trade um, exists, and we have to um, create such kind of. Um, means uh, such kind of uh, we need to create such a such way of regulation that would help us uh, to make this correlation. Technology uh, exists, but the implementation of these technologies uh, is uh, not perfect for now because there is no such a connection, legal connection of these platforms uh, that uh, could help these technologies to develop um, further. And there is also some common pr uh, problem, uh, such as uh, uh, cyber, uh, the, the protection from cyber attacks. Uh, that uh, you know that uh, the other side of uh, digitalization is uh, that these aspects. I mean the. Um, uh, that all process that uh, goes into digital sphere becomes uh, more depending on uh, future attacks from uh, uh, the, from uh, people and from uh, organiz organizations uh, who um, wants to uh, spoil, who wants to uh, interfere into the uh, deals of a certain person of the organization and of the country itself. And uh, we have to protect uh, these uh, creation, these intelligent transportation systems, uh, these transportation uh, uh, digital documentation uh, turn over uh, from these uh, cyber attacks. And uh, it is a real problem because uh, you know that um, some elements of digitalization um, uh, 
exist now uh, in the transportation sphere. And even now, we have records of uh, such um, attacks uh, that can um, cost uh, the life of people uh, and uh, the, of course, money. Uh, that's why we have to uh, make collaboration, international collaboration, uh, to think about uh, the um, appropriate uh, solution for um, uh, for a proper regulation of for such uh, new technologies that we would apply uh, in our daily life and in business life. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Professor Bajna. Nitish, Professor Nitish. Now, please, Nitish, uh, you're going to speak about artificial intelligence and human rights, designing a roadmap for future. Thanks for being here with us and send my regards and my love to every, each and every one of the friends in India, a great country. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. I'm really sorry for my bad throat, but I'll try to do the justice with the topic. So AI and its, its impact on human rights. And I'm not right. I have not written in the PPT, designing a roadmap for future, because I think there is a lot of research that we require to do on how to design the roadmap, how, what could be the future. So let's see a future. I may be talking certain things, which is not possible yet, but they will be possible uh, maybe another decade, they all things will be possible. And we have to, when we are developing laws related to artificial intelligence, we have to keep those things also in our mind, how to tackle them, what we should do for future, because we are talking something which is in present and will develop definitely in future. So what is AI? I will not discuss a very brief uh, about AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, Deep learning, there is more to it, neural network, uh, feature learning, image-based learning and all, game theory learning. So first, AI is friend of mankind. What AI can do, what human beings cannot. So when we are talking in terms of human rights, so I'll not show the challenges first. I'll show what is the best AI can do, what human cannot. So let's take there is a Spanish researcher has developed something called, Maria Mem was talking about cybercrime. I'm discussing about one of such cybercrime that is pedophile. People who are into child pornography and child sextortion and child sexual activities. This Negabot is developed by a Spanish researcher. And what it do, it's not a normal chatbot, which because chatbots are highly predictable. You can predict what they are chatting. You understand that what they write, it's a chatbot, it's not a normal human being. But these Spanish researchers have developed Negabot as a game theory based artificial intelligence, which enters in, into different chat rooms and behaves like a girl of 14 years. It also technically, if you talk, it also makes mistakes so that if somebody is reading or somebody is chatting or some pedophile is there, he or she should understand that, yes, this is a child of 14 years because they are making language error, errors. So it do all kind of a thing. It, it makes language errors. It becomes angry at times. It becomes happy at times. It will not respond to you for a certain time, and then it may be responding you. And if it finds that you are a pedophile, then all the data is being communicated to the local police. All the data has been sent to them. So many countries are using this uh, tool for curbing online pornography, especially related to child pornography. When you're talking in terms of AI, not just child pornography, it can actually stop all kind of pornography that can be shared. It can also help to remove hate speech from social media and other platforms, because sometimes hate speech can have really disastrous results, having communal violence, killing of people, targeting of a particular group or ethnicity. So it can curb AI in future can no doubt it's doing uh, as of now as well. If you see Facebook, if you see uh, any other social networking platform, they're using it for controlling hate speech. Not all can be controlled because not so developed yet, 
but through machine learning they will in future they will be able to develop to a level where all kind of hate speech can be controlled it can also control things related which can actually create communal violence which are copyright infringement no doubt you can see youtube is doing it through its ai technology if you drop a video which belongs to somebody else or you are using a song once i was delivering a lecture on how to use song for research or for teaching human rights it blocked my video stating that i'm doing a copyright infringement whereas when we are talking in terms of laws of india if you are using anything for educational purpose and not making money out of it then it is you will not be called for an action of copyright infringement anyways what else it could do care about in covid human to human service by doctors and nurses were becoming tough the number of doctors and nurses have gone down even we have loss of life around the globe of lot of people who were serving who were in the medical field so in future there could be care boards which can protect which are kind of robots which can give maybe you know drugs to people provide them medicine there are also small uh, elizabeth memo talking that there are ai which can uh, very clearly and easily figure out cancer at a very pre stage so we think i think that in future there will be more care boards and more technology which can help people in distress people who are requiring emergent health care uh maybe a emergency self driven ambulance which can reach anywhere faster than human being with just a simple command on a mobile or any app next is disaster manager management and hazardous waste management many a times human cannot reach all the places maybe let's take if it's about disposing a bomb there is always a life threat but imagine a uh, ai based robot diffusing a bomb it definitely saving human life also think of a war where there is a use of a nuclear weapon or chemical weapon think of international committee of red cross staff how they can help these wounded and sick during war it's almost impossible at times when there is a chemical weapon attack or biological weapon attack or nuclear weapon attack but yes if there is a ai based robot it can help people who are wounded and sick during war it could help people in droughts in floods in earthquakes and it can do this job i think without if you're using ai there will be no human loss human life loss in terms of the people who are providing the humanitarian assistance to people who need the humanitarian assistance in terms of nuclear waste and other hazardous waste ai devices can actually help in terms of hazardous waste management without directly affecting the life of the people next is crime prevention we will be also discussing how crime prevention because there is always a two side when we are talking in terms of ai as friend of mankind we will be also talking in terms of ai as an enemy of mankind crime prevention through facial recognition techniques frt you can find out who is a terrorist whose face looks similar to a terrorist who is a criminal where is the criminal what is his right time location and maybe it can help you in preventing various crimes but can ai commit a crime i'll give you an example let's imagine you want to kill somebody who stays with you so let's take you and your friend are sharing a room and you want to kill him with whatever x y z reason and your house is a smart house your house is based on smart technology smart city so a smart house where you have created as soon as you will enter the uh, you will step in front of the door it will read your and your friend's facial expressions and retina and then it will open the doors next thing it will do is it will start the geezer and it will also start the microwave now imagine you want to kill your friend and you just keep your gas burner on and you place a aluminum foil in the in the microwave the now the microwave will start because it is pre program as soon as you will enter after 10 minutes it will start the gas wall is already open there will be a blast or there will be a fire and you will die and 
I think no one around in the world will be able to gather any evidence in terms of any foul play. I'll give you a case of a cyber murder. There are two gangs. One gang leader is shot by the another gang leader. He went to hospital. The nurse has given him a dose, which is three times more than the expected dose to any human being to survive. The person died then and there, and the nurse being caught for murder of this particular person, the gang leader. After six months, it, it came to the knowledge of police after thorough investigation that somebody has tempered the data. Somebody has done a data diddling, D A data D I D D L I N G data diddling in which they have increased the dose which was to be given to a patient. And the nurse, after looking at the screen, always work the software, what is provided in terms of the amount of the dose. So a nurse was in jail for six months, committing no crime because somebody somewhere had the hospital software and increased the amount of dose to be given to a, to a patient. So we have to think of these kind of things in future. We have to be really smart when we are talking in terms of use of AI for everything, use of AI for teaching, use of the next thing that we are discussing is education. So when we are talking of education, let's talk about a special education for special childs, for disabled or differently able people. AI can read, AI can dictate them, AI can also teach and answer their queries because these people are very shy when they're in class and also often neglected but this ai will make them more confident and can reach to them can do a braille reading can dictate things can help them in assignments and things and make their life best it can also use in terms of management of what kind of behavior students have so behavioral management softwares based on ai could be there which can talk to students counsel them in care in times of need which will definitely reduce the mental stress and also the number of suicide that happens the number of self killing that happens in student of young age it could definitely help in medicine discovery so let's let's take there was covid 19 then now this Omicron is there. If there is an AI which is very intelligent and which can read everything possible through machine learning, data learning, feature learning, and can discover a medicine, that could be a real help to humankind. Gene editing, there are two types of gene editing. One is germline gene editing. Other is somatic gene editing. When you're talking in terms of somatic gene editing, it can cure a lot of diseases cancer, HIV, any STD. So it will break the diseased gene. It will remove that gene. It will place a new gene into it, a new gene code from your own gene code. When you're talking in terms of germline gene editing, it is basically you can design a baby. So you can design a baby saying that, okay, if you do a gene editing, my baby will be six feet tall very fair in complexion, very intelligent with a good eyesight and everything you can decide. Are we sure we are going to do germline gene editing in future through AI or through even otherwise by medical practitioners using different softwares? The world will be at danger because you never know what you have done to a human race and maybe because it's a germline, it will go to one generation to another. So Somatic stays for one person only. So if you do a gene editing in one person, it stays in that person. Next generation will not have any effect of that gene editing. But if you do a germline gene editing, next all coming generations will have an effect of it. Are we ready to face such kind of challenges? I think definitely we are not ready to face these kind of challenges in future where we have different set of humans. And yes, the world is talking about designer babies not just care what they're talking about they're talking about designer baby having all features what their parents want height weight intellect eyesight everything so now these are some of the ways in which it could be really useful ai in future there are many other things for let's take in transportation in terms of helping people follow rules and regulations 
it could be helpful in criminal justice mechanism system but there are many loopholes there are many negatives of ai so let's move to the next slide ai and human rights challenges so ai reads in a particular way because of machine learning all the data is no doubt the previous data that existed there is no new data that is being fed you cannot feed a future data you can feed only things which had happened today at present or which is at the past so now if there is a trend in a society in terms of let's take black people do more crimes if this was a trend in 1950s to 1970s and you have created this data the ai based software if it's work on facial recognition technique as soon as you are a black it will show you as a red flag saying that this person has a major chances of violating a law so there is an example when you search on google photos google has improved this once it was searched about gorillas and there was a pictures of two black girls were there in google images which also works on ai based technology so which is violating the racial rights of black people if you search for hiv patients there are a lot of times the pictures will be shown of non hiv patients too even in india if you talk on terms disclosing identity of hiv patient is very important in terms of privacy it could only be disclosed to the close family members or members with whom this person can have a sexual intimacy in future so ai can actually discriminate being online and can have issues in terms of a particular set of people there are various types of these technologies is being used and people of african american origin are being red flagged and because of their historical data that is being fed into these ai based softwares also there is very one important thing that is happening and it's happening under the nose of the world in china there are 1.8 million uyghurs muslims they are detained and they, they are under constant surveillance by various facial recognition techniques so let's take if china decides to do a genocide ethnic cleansing of all the uyghurs it can very easily track through facial recognition technique which area of china has how many numbers of uyghur muslims where they are heading to where they are staying and killing them will not be a tough job are we ready for such kind of challenges imagine this at the time of it, the genocide that happened at rwanda between hutu and tutsi imagine all hutu people having these data of tutsi people where they stay how they look and this fpt provide their real time movement data there were 50% of tutsis were killed in genocide of rwanda if this technology was there it could have been to 90 to 200% ethnic cleansing of a particular community so we have to be really careful when you are using such kind of things in future and ai vetting process in the world is being like okay you have to be very strict with vetting process there are many countries like germany like united states which are using various technologies of dialect recognition so if i speak i speak in an indian way maria ma'am uh, masha ma'am speaks in a way a russian speaks so even if we speak english we have a little indian and russian to and brazilian touch to it and if there is a ai which can predict our dialect so let's take imagine in a case of a refugee who is coming to your country for asylum it's easy that you can very easily predict you can do a stated determination of all these refugees by using a dialect recognition you can communicate with them in their own dialect by using these ai so this is a positive impact perfectly all right but just think about any fault play that happen with this ai any kind of hacking or a data diddling or a software change or a small breach of particular information in the ai i hope there is a life of lot of and thousand of these refugees will be in trouble so there is a human rights watch which is against these kind of discriminatory decision based vetting processes and around the globe it is having a movement stating that they should not be used for 
uh, vetting of or for a certain determination of refugees and asylum seekers. Let's take about artificial intelligence and international humanitarian law. They can be used in war, robo army, use of drone, automated military vehicles, automated vehicles for humanitarian assistance. All these are the future. There are also countries which are using, Israel is using an anti missile system based on AI, which can predict a missile and can diffuse the missile in air itself. How it works? It works on a system of observe, orient, decide and act. Till now, most of these AI-based software, especially drones and things which are uh, automated military vehicles, are being operated till phase three, observe, orient, and decide, whereas act is being decided by a human being sitting far off. So he decides whether a place to be attacked or not, whether there should be a drone attack on a particular community or a particular locality or a military installation. So not AI is designing, AI is deciding everything. Let's imagine AI is deciding everything. It can cause disastrous result in future when you are using it in terms of war. And now what will happen if this autonomous, automated weapon system falls in hand of terrorists who will not follow any humanitarian law, which will not follow any human rights? What will happen if it reaches to a hostile group which is ready to kill civilians? So there are, are many questions that are unanswered and we require the answer in future. Also, it will fail on the ground of military necessity and distinction, proportionality of use. These are some of the uses of uh, AI. Also, when we are talking in terms of volition, because I am on the, on the page of volition, AI can violate various intellectual property rights because when you are feeding a lot of data, machine learning data to AI-based technology, then you are giving a lot of data which could be a copyright of somebody, which could be a patent of somebody, which could have been using in terms of trademark and all. It could be very helpful and it could be very disastrous at the same time. And we should be using AI technologies in future only when we are sure what and to what extent we are using it. I am staying in a country whose population is 138 million and every day there are thousands of cases of sextortion, online bullying, cyber pornography, cyber extortions. We have cases of data diddling. We have cases of blue snurfing, blue jacking, zoos attack. Thousands of adware, malwares are there in our systems. Are we ready to implement AI 100% to our life? If or not, we need to think over it because it can act both dual purpose it can serve. It can protect and it can violate both. It can help in environmental predictions regarding anything. So it can help in disaster management, making people aware of it. It can handle terrorism. A lot of things it can do in terms of data protection, copyrights and also but it can violate at the same time too. So whenever we are deciding, as it was told by, uh, told by Masha Ma'am, that we require international cooperation, not just in terms of sharing of AI and technologies, but also in terms of sharing the best practices in terms of legal implementation of AI, if you are using it, or what will be the liability of AI in case anything goes wrong. So we have to work on the roadmap for the future. Hope uh, with the research in future we will be able to design such a roadmap where ai can be an integral part of our life without having much risk to human survival thank you very much thank you thank you my dear friend nitish for the for the brilliant lecture and i think we don't have any 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 questions but you know uh, thanks for being here, for joining us, Nitish and Masha and Professor Gromova. And we hope to see you guys in a near future event. And let's keep our journal going. That's, that was the goal of this, of this event. Thanks a lot and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>